DNA is the ultimate method of biological information storage. It contains a full genetic instruction manual for creating life, from eye color to height to the probability of getting certain diseases. It's the reason that traits are passed down through generations. Hi, I'm Rich Burnett for Wondrium, and in this episode of Perspectives, four experts explain what DNA is, how we discovered it, and how it makes you, you. We begin with an overview of DNA and how we inherit traits from our ancestors. Bacteria make more bacteria, kangaroos make more kangaroos, and dandelions send their fluffy seeds wafting gracefully on the wind to make many more dandelions. But what is it in the seeds that can do that? And how come they always give rise to dandelions and not ever, even once, to Dalmatians or ducks? The answer to those questions lies in deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. This nucleic acid molecule carried in the seeds has the complete instructions for making dandelions, which happen to be different from the information for making any other species. Well, in the nucleic acid that is DNA, we have a single molecule with all the information for making all the proteins in each of the trillions of the body's cells. When you think about what this really means, it boggles the mind. One molecule determines that a child has grandpa's nose, mom's musical talent, and great-grandmother's distinctive cheekbones. On its way to you and me, our DNA has passed through each generation of our ancestors. In each generation, the DNA of two individuals mingled to create unique combinations carried by their children. The fertilized egg that gives rise to each individual contains this DNA, which is copied each time a cell divides, with a copy of the information passed on to every one of the trillions of cells in a human baby. Deoxyribonucleic acid is a substance, a chemical. You can get DNA stuck to your fingers. It appears inside our cells. And this sticky stuff was first discovered by a biochemist named Friedrich Miescher. In the late 1860s, his boss assigned him the task of studying white blood cells. Miescher specifically chose to focus on the nucleus of the white blood cells, at a time when the function of a cell nucleus was unknown. To get white blood cells, Miescher had to visit a local hospital each day. There, he picked up their used, pus-soaked bandages since pus is swimming with white blood cells. No one ever said science had to be glamorous. And to see what chemicals were in the nucleus of the white blood cells, Misha ran some chemical tests. One test involved washing the pus in warm alcohol, then rinsing it in an acid from a pig's stomach. This dissolved away the cell membranes and allowed him to isolate a gray paste. Misha assumed this paste was a protein so he ran some tests to identify it. But the paste didn't behave like a protein would. It wouldn't dissolve in salt water, or boiling vinegar, or even in dilute hydrochloric acid. His paste also contained phosphorus, an element that proteins lack. Convinced he'd found something new and unique in the nucleus of those cells, Miescher named the substance nucleus. And his discovery contained what we now call DNA. It was a Russian researcher by the name of Phoebus Levine who started scientists on the long road to understanding the structure of this critical material that Miescher had discovered. Levine was able to break the so-called nuclein down into its constituent parts. He found phosphates, four organic bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, and interestingly, a sugar called ribose. In 1940, nearly 70 years after Miescher's discovery of nucleon, Erwin Chargaff made a telling observation. He noticed that when he isolated all four of the bases found by Levine, cytosine and guanine were always present in equal amounts, as were adenine and thymine. It was an intriguing observation, and one that hinted at the structure of DNA. Tantalizing as this observation was, debate still raged about exactly what DNA was and how the molecule was put together. 
the world would have to wait another decade to settle this argument. The key piece of data that unlocked the secrets of this biopolymer was one from the same technique that had proven Herman Staudinger right about cellulose, X-ray crystallography. The lab of Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin at King's College in London, as well as that of James Watson and Francis Crick, generated that X-ray crystallography data almost concurrently. A race to press ensued, and Watson and Crick prevailed, securing their place in history as the widely credited discoverers of this, the DNA double helix. The structure we are most familiar with is a molecule that looks a bit like a rope ladder twisted on itself. Two sides of the ladder serve as backbones of individual DNA strands. Separating the strands, we discover that each strand is a long polymer. The repeating subunits comprising the polymer are called nucleotides. Each nucleotide is made up of three components, a five carbon sugar, a nitrogen containing part called a base, and one or more phosphates. Without phosphate, the resulting molecule is called a nucleoside. Nucleotides that DNA is built from are called deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates, or DNTPs. Deoxyribose, the sugar in DNA nucleotides, has five carbons, designated 1 prime, 2 prime, 3 prime, 4 prime, and 5 prime. Why the prime? That's because the base in a nucleotide, which has its own carbons, is also numbered 1, 2, 3, etc. The prime indicates we're talking about the sugar's carbons. The sugar in DNA would be ribose, except that its two prime carbon lacks the oxygen and has only a hydrogen atom attached. So we call this sugar deoxyribose or two prime deoxyribose. Each nucleotide for building DNA brings energy to the job in the form of three phosphates attached to the carbon at the five prime position. Also attached to the deoxyribose sugar is a structure called a base. There are four different bases in DNA nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, abbreviated A, G, C, and T. The related molecule called RNA has the same bases, except that uracil, U, substitutes for thymine. A double helix contains two such DNA strands, oriented in opposite or anti-parallel directions, with the five prime end of one strand across from the three prime end of the other. Bases in the two strands are oriented such that the A's and T's always face each other, and G's and C's are always across from each other as well. The pairs of bases then form what look like the rungs of a ladder inside of a DNA helix, with sugar phosphate backbones forming the sides. The ladder twists on itself, resembling a spiral staircase. Why do bases pair as they do and never switch partners? It's because the hydrogen bonds between the bases only properly align when G is adjacent to C and when A is adjacent to T. The A's and T's share two hydrogen bonds, while G's and C's have three hydrogen bonds between them. Since A pairs with T and G pairs with C, it means that if we know the order or sequence of bases in one strand, we can figure out the sequence of bases on the partner strand. It is in the order or sequence of these bases, A, G, T, and C, that information is encoded. Now, what kind of information exactly? Well, one major function of the information in DNA is to provide instructions for making proteins. Proteins are built from amino acids, as you've learned. But how do cells know the order to string the amino acids together to make each protein? It turns out that the information for amino acids arises directly from the sequence of bases in DNA. So the sequence of bases in DNA stores information for making proteins. Darwin recognized that his theory meant that all organisms could trace their history back to common ancestors. Any two species, no matter how different, share a common ancestor if you go back far enough in time. He suggested that the history of evolution can be thought of as a great tree of life in which all the branches are connected. 
The availability of DNA sequence data had two major impacts on efforts to reconstruct the tree of life. First, it meant that far more data were available. The position of every DNA base in the genome, like the first DNA letter for a particular gene or the 175th position for a particular gene, could be considered a trait in a phylogenetic analysis, much like the presence or absence of mammary glands. Because the genomes of many organisms are measured in megabases, with one megabase equal to one million DNA bases, using genome sequences provides millions of traits to study each organism, a lot more data for reconstructing the tree of life. Moreover, biologists also developed ways to use all this data in more sophisticated ways. The only way for the DNA in an organism's genome to change from one base, like an A, to another, like a C, is through a mutation. And biologists have been able to work out how often these mutations occur, on average, in different groups of organisms. As elegant and remarkable as all of these features of DNA are, what really makes this molecule of life useful is the fact that it is a polymer. DNA strands can reach truly staggering lengths in higher organisms, and you are a perfect example. The snippets of DNA that I've been showing you pale in comparison to the size of your actual DNA sequence. The human genome, as it's called, consists of some 5 billion base pairs strung together. That's enough DNA to create a 1.8 meter strand when extended completely, nearly as tall as I am. This makes DNA the undisputed king of information storage. Five billion letters go into the code that defines who you are, at least in a biochemical sense. Hey, thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the topics in this episode, the full list of series that these clips came from is in the description below. You can watch them all on Wondrium. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel for new episodes of Perspectives, and you can watch previous ones here.